uh, Catherine Jones. I work, I lead the Energy Data Centre at STFC. And unlike many of the panellists, I've only been with you, Kirk, since March uh, 2020. So I feel very new. Um, and my background is in uh, discovery tools and open access to publications, data and software, but not in the energy sector. So it's been really interesting learning about the similarities and differences of energy data. So starting off, UCOC has always valued data. This is uh, the interface in 2006, well before my time, where you could search for data and you could search for projects in the energy sphere. This is what it now looks in 2024. So it does very similar things, but shinier, prettier, in lovely UCOC colours. Um, and this is our main interface. And on this far side is our latest development, which is bringing together all the research outputs that we hold on specific consortia. And this is example is UCIRC. So there's been lots of things happening in uh, policy in research data, academic research data, in the 20 years UCIRC has run. And I think we need to acknowledge that research data is an important outcome of research and it helps people to uh, build and um, progress. And that um, as the UKRI research data, uh, principle one says that publicly funded research data is a public good and should be um, produced in the public interest. So the boxes along the screen show the major shifts in policy over those 20 years. So in, when UKIRT was born, research councils had data policies but they were all very different because they were different research councils. And then over the time, they've gone from common data principles to a concordat on research data, which brought in the universities. In 2016, fair data principles, which is that research data should be findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, came from the bottom up, really, from researchers actually thinking about it rather than policy going down. And um, then, as the decade went on, there was more interest in um, transparency and reusability. And there was the Concordat on the support for research integrity, because that's an important part of research integrity. In 2022, um, a group looked at uh, whether you could apply fair data principles to research data, research software rather, because most, lots of research data needs the research software to be usable and be reusable. And then coming soon, but hasn't arrived yet, um, UKRI are looking at their data policy again, and it'll be interesting to see what changes that will bring. So I think to summarise, over the 20 years of UKIRC, there's been an increased emphasis on sharing data and the transparency of this. And also, I feel as a practitioner in this space, there's been a shift from expectation and no idea how to do it, to inching towards practice and it being a part, routine part of academic behaviour to think about how you're going to create your data and share it. So having set the policy framework, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the Energy Data Centre has done mostly in UCIRC 4. So in UCIRC 4, data management planning was a KPI of the project. In fact, it still is because we haven't quite finished yet. And that meant that the Energy Data Centre, we've given support, um, we've run the process that encourages people to consciously manage their data, my favourite phrase, make conscious decisions rather than unconscious decisions, and using the widely known phrase, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Not everything can be open. But if you start from a perspective that you want to make it open, it's more likely to be able to be freely shared. And um, even though I run a data centre and I want your data, um, I still say that you should put it where your reusers will find it. And for social sciences, <laughs> that's the UK Data Archive. So um, on the far side is our uh, screenshot of where all our excellent advice and policy is. So we also um, have our discovery portal and we've maintained that <laughs> over the 20 years. Um, but in UKIRT 4, we've increased the usability and added new functions. So it doesn't just hold research data, it holds what I call grey literature, um, informally published 
publications and information on energy projects and some external visualizations. And we've increased the content and we um, support users and answer inquiries. And the pictures are information on how much data we hold, how many projects and what our publications are. As this talks about uh, data, um, this is a little bit about how you can explore our data by lots of different organized facets that we've added to make it more discoverable. You can do a search, you can filter the search, um, and then there's one at the end with the actual answer. You can deposit data. We hold not just data, but actually metadata only records to interesting relevant energy data. So we're hoping that you'll be able to come and find it um, even if we don't hold it. Our most popular data set that we've held is this one here, which coincidentally Maysan will be talking about a bit later on. Um, and over UCOT4, we've had over a thousand distinct users of the data we hold. So we haven't just um, done data management. We wanted to share best practice. So last autumn, um, together with the Centre for, I can never remember what CRED stands for, Centre for Reduction Energy Demand Solutions, uh, we held a workshop on uh, data sharing in energy consortiums. Because um, as someone who's new to energy, the really interesting thing from a data management perspective is the fact that there are lots of really big consortiums with projects within projects and that the data management space tends to expect quite a small project where you do a data management plan for a project and that's it. Whereas this, you know, in any energy, you know, the energy data center is tracking, I think it is 40 projects out of the UK at four. Um, so we uh, ran this workshop where Mike Cochin helped us facilitate it um, to share experiences, identify barriers and identify next steps. And uh, these are the outputs. So there were some all about more training, uh, more tools and guidance, um, re recognise and reward the effort it takes to make your data shareable. Um, not all data is equal. Put, different effort into different data sets. Some of this uh, you'd get from any uh, workshop. I think the interesting things that are a bit more energy focused was about whether we could be a peer network for energy data managers. So all these consortia tend to have somebody who does data management planning. Can we get together and do it all better? Um, and the other thing that came out quite strongly was it's um, sharing energy modeled inputs and outputs uh, more widely needs more guidance and um, those two um, I'm taking up going forward both in Newkirk and other projects. So um, rounding out up uh, we have some key priorities going forward. So our obvious one is to ensure that the service uh, develops and is yes. um, is secure and uh, maintainable um, and delivers to the people who use us. Uh, we're very interested in ensuring that we support people to produce fair data and we're involved in an EU project about uh, how do we as a repository help our users become fair data and what does fair data in a repository context mean. I'm particularly keen, I'm keen on everything aren't I really, but I'm particularly keen on uh, sustainability and the energy use. We're keeping energy data for the long term. That takes energy. So how can we ensure that we use the minimum for the maximum benefit? And I firmly believe in the next five years, researchers will get carbon budgets and part of carbon budget will be where you put your data and how much it is. Now that is a bit twinkly, but we're really interested. I'm really interested in how do we establish that. Um, I want, we want to build out from um, Newkirk Grey Literature and ETI, we hold uh, the outputs of the Energy Technologies Institute, to other um, consortia, because Grey Literature, the, the stuff that's informally published as a, as a librarian, I can tell you, is you can lose it really easily and it has, holds lots of really valuable information. 
so we'd like to build on that. And then finally, in the computing world, there's lots of work around the UKRI's digital research infrastructure. That's all about how the digital infrastructure that UKRI funds is uh, bound together with common standards and common um, professional development. And we'd, we um, seek to be part of that through UKIRC and other projects. Um, I haven't done this on my own. Um, the ERU staff, the Energy Research Unit staff, there's Jim, who's been here from the very beginning, our leading light, and Peter, who's a technical lead, and me at the moment. But in the past, we've had uh, Jeff, Sarah, Alan, and Leslie, and a whole host of people at STFC, who are too many to put on the slide, who support us by supporting our hardware. Um, and um, I put up my uh, picture of uh, the UKIRC outputs again, just to remind us all that you know, the Energy Data Centre is here to support the access to the research outputs of the researchers in this room and others, and um, to help publicise and get um, it as widely used as possible. Thank you, Catherine, for talking about data. It's a nice uh, segment to talking about uh, modelling. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Neil Strachan. Um, I'm a co-director. Um, I run the modelling hub at UCA. and I've been involved uh, with UKIRC uh, since 2004. Um, modeling has been a centerpiece um, of UKIRC. Uh, UKIRC has been a driver of energy modeling um, in the UK um, over many years. So let's spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, that journey. Um, it's important, uh, as, uh, as many of you know, that, that, that um, uh, models are maps. They are abstractions. Peter Taylor calls them boundary objects. They are a way for us to think uh, uh, and structure a problem. They are uh, not designed to be truth machines. They're a way to try to think our way through. Uh, this is one of the earliest maps um, of the UK. It's from the Romans. They've got some things right. Uh, they don't seem to have got Scotland right, unfortunately. That's probably because they didn't spend much time there. Um, but we build uh, models with, 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 with abstractions. And different models will make different simplifications. Um, so you might, for example, only have a single um, decision maker, although we know lots and lots of people are making decisions in the energy system. Um, this idea of a single and expert decision maker is, is, is just one of these striking assumptions that um, um, I find harder and harder. I mean, if you, it doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum, but I think you can agree that we do not have a decision making that is clear and consistent over many, many decades to solve the energy transition issue. Uh, so hold this idea of models as um, abstractions. Uh, we don't always get um, uh, uh, things right, but when modelers get things wrong, we try to understand why we got these things wrong. So this is a chart that was originally presented at the um, UK Annual Assembly in Edinburgh on the 5th of July 2006. Some of you were there. Some of you probably can't remember if you were there or not. Uh, but uh, this is some of the earliest um, outputs of our energy system model. Um, you can note a, a few things um, um, uh, about it. First, it's being developed as, as part of a, a long collaboration with the UK government, but not DESNES, not Bayes, not, not DEC, not BUR, but the DTI. Secondly, we were looking at a 60% uh, 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 um, a reduction uh, relative to 1990 levels by the year 2050. Um, that makes things very different if you're looking at a 60% reduction rather than 80% reduction or 100% reduction. So, for example, in, in that sort of world, you don't need to decarbonize uh, transport and buildings. So you don't have a huge growth in electricity, which I think that we are now wrestling with. Um, the other thing to think about is, is were we right or, or, or not? So this is the electricity generation uh, from this particular model run. Uh, it's got some things. Um, in fact, it's got almost everything wrong, to be honest. Um, uh, it's got a whole bunch of coal in the system because there's still an, uh, um, a stuff for the, for, for the emissions cap. Gas is far too expensive. Uh, we've uh, shut all of our nuclear uh, uh, power stations. Um, and uh, wind and solar um, are either uh, only just uh, starting um, or haven't even started yet. Now, the idea is not to say we'll be right 20 years later, but the idea is to understand why we were wrong. So the fact we're in, in a different constrained system, the fact we've had huge learning um, uh, in terms of re renewable technologies and other things is, is why models are, are, are useful to go back and look at. Um, 
This is a, um, um, a chart that tries to show the evolution of, of, of one of UKIRK's major models, which was the energy system Markel model, which is now the Times model. Um, I originally developed it. Uh, Paul Dodds, my uh, UCL colleague at the back, is now the uh, a person driving this. Um, and what this chart uh, uh, tries to show is that the function of models changes through time from, uh, from trying to set targets to try to actually implement those targets. Um, uh, this model has had a real underpinning role in the, uh, in, in the various government departments and in the Committee on Climate Change. Um, it's required anchoring funding from a range of projects of which UK, UKIRK has been the most important. At UCL, we have, uh, I think, or the Strachan three-person rule. You need three people to really understand any model. And the reason for that critical mass is one person's just arrived and one person's just about to leave. And if you don't have that critical mass, you can't develop a model. The other thing um, right at the bottom is how this model has evolved. And it's evolved according to the policy landscape and the research questions. So it's evolved from looking at the energy system to looking at the macroeconomic implications to looking at the international drivers to looking at uncertainty to detailed modeling of the power sector and so on. So models are these living, breathing organisms. Um, it's not just our models that have evolved. All energy modelers um, have evolved their thinking. Uh, these are two classic uh, uh, um, uh, modeling typologies from uh, um, over a decade apart. We used to think as long as we understood the technology and we understood the economics, both in terms of consumers and in terms of the macro um, economy, that's all we actually needed to know for the energy transition. And that's the um, um, our cards typology on the left. The typology on the right, which I like a lot more because it's from one of my research papers, uh, is much, much more complicated and is really trying to bring in uh, these uh, role of different actors, the drivers of society and, and cultural changes, the role of uh, politics and so on. And this is uh, my own personal theme, this idea of evolving from not just techno-economics, which is really important and always will be, but also to consider the social political side. If you are going to evolve the, the focus of your, um, uh, of your model, uh, you're going to have to interact with some very different research communities than you did. Uh, this uh, um, is, is designed to show on the right us energy modelers, and I'm still in that category. We think a particular way. We have a particular theoretical underpinning. We like data. We like um, uh, being able to put that into a quantitative framework. The one on the left is from the sustainability transitions community. That's the multi-level perspective, which many of you will be familiar with. But those guys think very differently. Different theories, different uh, thoughts on actors, uh, different thoughts on the drivers of change. And there's a very live debate as how you link these very qualitative or, 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 or conceptual approaches with a modeling approach. Some people say you shouldn't do it. Some people say you should build an all singing or dancing model. And some people say you should have some sort of iterative bridging process, perhaps driven through participation and, uh, uh, and through the use of, of sophisticated scenarios. So coming back to the UK, um, there's been a huge growth um, in the number of models, and we know that because the UK Energy Research Centre has, has, ha, has done this really nice survey. Um, um, uh, in, uh, we had 78 models in our database um, um, uh, when we first did the survey in 2020. Um, and it's important that it's not just more models, but also who's building them. So it's not just academia. Uh, government holds a lot of the capacity, but also uh, private consulting. I mean, there are some big consulting firms and their business model is is, is often driven by models. So that has big implications in their funding, their ability to be transparent, and, um, and their ability to share those models. Um, as well as the growth in the models, there's been a huge growth in the models being applied to different topics, as you you'd expect as the policy and the investment uh, environment has moved. Uh, um, the most common ones are the things we've wrestled with a long time. So uh, carbon re re reductions, long-term pathways, um, how much this should cost. Can we get the electricity sector to work with lots of intermittency? Um, but there are some uh, uh, um, uh, uh, newer models. Uh, I think there aren't enough in this area yet, but looking at things such as societal change, political change, uh, looking at health impacts, looking at equity, uh, justice, and fairness. And this is a live debate. Thank you.
So, closing thoughts. Um, uh, um, it's been uh, fascinating over 20 years to be part of the UCA journey with models. So these are my three closing thoughts to leave you with. Uh, number one, um, don't model to give uh, the right answer to the wrong question. I really don't want to see a, a modeler tell me what the carbon price should be in 2045. That's not the question we're trying to answer. Um, it may be the answer that the model gives, but you, you, uh, you should be trying to uh, give the answer that a policy uh, and industrial de decision makers really want. Um, and this idea of new um, answers is really not correct. It's really new insights. It's really trying to think, for example, what changes faster? Is it technology change or is it societal change? Can you give insights into some of these really big ticket new um, 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 issues coming up? And thirdly, um, as you're developing these models, really try to reach out to the non-modeling community because there's a whole bunch of things that us modelers need that we just don't have the answer to. So we don't necessarily know how quickly technologies will actually be um, developing. We don't know how uh, consistent policies will be. We don't know how people will really respond to prices or, or other mechanisms. And other fields that do uh, um, empirical or, or other methods are really necessary to try to give those building blocks for the next generation of models. That's me. Thank you very much. So who would like to kick us off? Oop, uh, where, where's the mic? Who has the mic? There's a question here. Well, to be fair, this guy was first. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, it's Jonathan Rattler from the University of Birmingham. So, see, one, one of the real barriers to implementation uh, over the next few years and decades uh, is at the local level and thinking about how we uh, engage uh, local government, local communities, and I think that harks back to some of the demand side things and how we engage people, uh, what, what sort of research could you, Kirk, be doing to evolve that and see how we can do that better? Thank you. Um, Jason, do you want to? Otherwise, I'm sure Jess might have something to say. Yeah, so uh, is it it's coming through? Okay, great. Um, yeah, good question. So um, I think Nick has already uh, responded or uh, made a statement earlier, Nick Pigeon, about um, the need to better understand how people are dealing with these issues in their everyday lives. And, you know, it, uh, and I think your question speaks to that, you know, in people's localities and in, in, in their communities, um, they're, they're facing these issues. And I think in, in Newkirk, I mean, over, over the years, we've, we've had a number of different ways in which we've tried to approach that challenge. Um, we've been involved in developing new forms of participation. Um, they can be deliberative processes, it could be other ways about finding out those concerns that might be within the communities and then kind of feeding that back into shaping up the solutions and the decisions that are going on at a local level and national level. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been doing through the Public Engagement Observatory that I mentioned earlier is to actually work with say those those organizations that are that are operating in particular regions or localities we've been working with a water company in the east anglian region um trying to help them uh, better understand uh you know the local communities in their region and the sorts of concerns they might have about you know what are seen as net zero it's it was seen as a triple carbon reduction technology a green hydrogen technology that was also um, a hyper efficient uh, way of uh, processing um, uh, wastewater and um, so in in the sense of, of kind of doing new forms of collaboration working with people on the ground who are trying to come up with these solutions around engaging society with the transition um, that's something that I think we have been quite active in and we'll be wanting to do a lot more of moving forward I think it's also important at local level to remember about um, industry and local authorities. So working with the general public is obviously incredibly important. Um, and the couple of the tools that we've been developing, one is to make um, information about where you can site your energy infrastructure on a local to regional level and what the environmental constraints are. That's the tool that I mentioned that Andrew Lovett had developed. We're looking, mm, he's in conversations now with 40 different local authorities to actually get that out there. And I think 
we have a lot of knowledge. I think now we're at a point where it's how we communicate that and share that. And I think doing that in a whole range of different ways, including tools and direct conversations is really important. From an industry perspective, the work that Alona has been doing, Alona Armstrong on solar, she's produced those protocols to enable um, solar, uh, new solar farms to be developed in a way that's environmentally conscious. And I think, again, it's about working with industry to share that information. So, yeah, just to, local is big, isn't it? It's oh, not just yeah. about individuals, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, can we take the next question, is it set? Uh, thank you. Um, Bean Midland from the Heat Pump Federation. Uh, we've got a parcel of work going on at the moment, uh, trying to tackle the issue of distressed purchasing. Something like 70 or 80% of replacement boilers are distressed purchases. And we're taking a data approach to start with. Um, of course, the data we need really it relates to individual properties and individual consumers. To what extent should we allow GDPR to be a barrier to progress? I'm holding this. I don't want to be holding this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, Does anyone? Well, well, I'm happy to have a go. Brilliant. Thanks, wow. Catherine. <laughs> um, GDPR is all about informed consent, isn't it? So, and I think uh, what we might say as professionals, we might not do as individuals, which is always, a, I think, a challenge, isn't it? Between, you might say, oh, yes, we'll share it all, and then, you know, you're asked if you're prepared to share yours, and you say no, um, which, I'm oh, sorry to sound so cynical. Um, GDPR is there to protect people's privacy, so you have to have a good reason. And um, I think it, and some protocols in place, and I don't know who's going to drive that, if you see what I mean. Who's, who's going to take responsibility for saying this is a good thing for the you know, United Kingdom, and therefore if you adopt this protocol towards sharing data. So I... I think you have to find someone who's prepared to own it. Brilliant, thank you. Completely open, unsecured, and they're worried about the data and how it's going to their house. Well, I think that goes back to my point. I mean, I've spent um, far too long in open access, and what people are prepared to do to put a publication into a repository is very minimal. What they expect other people to do, to put their publications into repositories, is huge. So I think um, it's about educating people and having a, a secure protocol in place so, you, so that people can have informed consent and make conscious decisions. Just because they use TikTok and everything and let it all go free doesn't mean it's right. It just means they're not informed enough. Don't get me going on this. I could okay. talk for Britain. Okay, let's <laughs> Um, I think we have another question over here, please. Yeah, hi, uh, Mark Winskill, uh, University of Edinburgh, and still in Newkirk uh, uh, from uh, Phase One days. So, Neil, uh, the, the world of uh, Energy 2050 and Phase One seem like a really simple kind of uh, world in terms of how Newkirk goes about. Uh, policy relevant research you know we we did all that modeling we did a kind of national energy system scenarios exercise we took it to uh, was it DTI or, or I forget what the department was but so that feels quite kind of uh, impossible to think about these days that that you know um, I mean I live in Scotland so S Scottish energy strategy and just transition plan is incredibly kind of um, important in thinking about energy system change um, you know, other people in Newkirk know very well. There's, there's lots of local uh, uh, agency now as well, as Jonathan was saying. So what, how can Newkirk kind of respond to that in terms of this changing research context and much more expectation around transdisciplinary research with user participation? Uh, how can it kind of hold the, the, the interdisciplinary integrated nature of what, what we're able to do in NG2050 in today's kind of much more dispersed world of uh, policy and uh, uh, system change? 
thanks, Mark. That's a great question. I, I mean, I think um, UKIRK has been flattered by um, imitation by lots of other uh, research consortia and lots of other groups. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, catapults and 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 um, industry groups as well who have really tried to do interdisciplinary stuff. Uh, for me, uh, particularly as I'm not part of UKIRK Five, uh, the challenge is uh, to move beyond interdisciplinary to truly transdisciplinary. Can we? actually as a community think about uh, developing new conceptual frameworks, new, new um, uh, uh, empirical experiments, new participatory experiments that are truly transdisciplinary. Um, I personally think the frontier is politics uh, and political economy. I think we, have, we, have, we are entering a stage that uh, we need more Political. I mean, we've we've done better at getting social scientists to join this crazy train. I think getting political scientists uh, and 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 not and not just to do a little bit of addition and and but to do true di uh, transdisciplinary work. And 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 we have a political economist scientist there actually. <laughs> well, obviously, <laughs> I think. But I mean, I also think that it, that does come back to the question of how we speak to one another like if you want to have a really transdisciplinary conversation you have to understand each other's basics first before you can have the conversation and that's why you Kirk is so important because you are bringing people together in a way that you can start having those basic conversations upon which you can then build something a bit more substantive when it comes to interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary work so um, we have time for one more question, if, if anyone has one. Because if not, I have a quick one. Sorry. <laughs> but it's quick. It should be easy. It's an easy one. So I wondered, you know, for those of you that have been doing it for a while, this reflection back over time, are there ways that you differently communicate your research and are there different groups of people with which you now communicate your research sort of versus 10 or 15 or so years ago? I mean, Neil, you might be talking to more political scientists now than, than you were previously. So if anyone wants to reflect on, on, on that methods or groups. Well, I'll say, oh, I'll, I'll say something. Um, the, I think um, one of the mistakes we, we made in the TPA at the start was that we tend to focus very much on doing our, a really great systematic review and writing off what we hoped was a great report, and then we think about communicating it, and that was, that was not the right way to do it, and that's why uh, increasingly we've tried to engage uh, the stakeholders during the entirety of the project. So, yeah, and I think that has generally worked much better. question and um, it's a really interesting kind of reflection because I think when I was speaking earlier I said when Newkirk formed there was there was an interest in a certain kind of participation public participation process there's a lot of work say for example around public deliberation deliberative process that are now called citizens assemblies you might have heard of them uh, and uh, I guess I was and others in Newkirk were involved in that work sort of around you know phase two early phases and the kind of you, the, the, the audience for that was of, of, often policymakers. You're trying to create that policy impact to get the policymakers to take on the views of the citizens and also maybe engagement practitioners in those communities. When we've gone forward and sort of tried to map the wider system of participation and engagement, we found that it's become more relevant to more people mm. and actors because there's a wider system that you're mapping. And so we're opening up to diverse forms of what we might call public relevance. And it, so, for instance, we've had, you know, activist groups or, 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 or environmental campaign groups who have come to us um, who have, might have quite radical perspectives. And they say, we actually like this map because we can see ourselves on the map, mm. you know, for pretty much not the first time. But it's quite rare that they see them an evidence collected around publics and society where they see say, activists and, and civil society groups on the map. That's just one specific uh, you know, example. So I think we've connected up with a whole range of across you know, public, private, and civil society, especially out into that citizen space, a lot more diverse. Brilliant. Thank you. Does anyone else want to? Very quickly. Um, it's a similar point to Phil's really about co-development so I think probably 15 years ago we'd have developed a tool or a model and then presented it at 
the people that we were hoping would use it. Whereas now we're developing those all the time with the people and, and checking in. And the proposal actually that Gail led recently um, that we've put together, it was about working with the stakeholders to say, what, what questions do you want us to answer? Right, and, and doing research with them rather than at them. Brilliant. I know I don't really f uh, fall into your long running um, <laughs> thing, but I think as someone who's come uh, new to the energy community and, and you, Kirk, it, it's really, and then done data management planning, it, it's really interesting to see how um, everyone's working towards the same aim, but there's also the influences of the domain they've come from. <laughs> Thank you.